excited to have our guest for our International Social to Global Luncheon because he's one of us that I just happened to have met. But he is a UB School of Social Work graduate. Come back. So once you graduate from here, we never fully let you go. It was in 1927. <laughs> you may also need to do some fact checking about this. <laughs> I know you can with them earlier today. No, people who do that never invite me back. <laughs> well, just enjoy then. Don't don't fact check. But yes, he is one of our graduates. Now he joined the Brockport faculty in 1978 after, among other posts, teaching and social work in Bogota, Colombia in 1964, civil affairs work with an infantry battalion in the U.S. Army in Vietnam, 1968-69, teaching seventh grade in an inner city school and administration and casework in public and private child welfare agencies. He has been the president of a U.S. branch of an international children's rights organization, a consultant for a variety of news organizations and international human rights organizations, and a guest on media programs around the world. He has completed commission studies for UNICEF, the first UNICEF study on child sex trafficking, and the Hague Conference on Private International Law, and has published four books as well as dozens of articles, book chapters, and book reviews. He has served as a member of the New York State Board for Social Work and the World Federation of Mental Health as president of chapter of the New York State Society of Clinical Social Work Psychotherapists and as the director of a Veterans Counseling Center. He has guest lectured and presented at a variety of local, state, and international conferences and professional meetings. He serves in a variety of service roles, including directing an NGO that serves the poor in Vietnam, the first study abroad program of its kind in Vietnam, Brockport's Vietnam program, that places American students in Vietnam for a blend of study and service. He teaches courses in international social work methods, child welfare, social policy, and social justice. But you didn't come here to listen to me talk. <laughs> He's going to speak with us about some really interesting partnerships that he has developed in Vietnam, some work that he's doing both in social work education and really grassroots stuff. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Ken Herman. I have a, uh, I have a new book on child welfare that should be coming out in the next few months, and that's longer than the book. <laughs> I don't know why the hell I, I worked on this manuscript for so long. This is so long. But thank you, Hillary. Um, we're here not only for my reunion, coming back to, uh, to UB again, uh, but also for me to suffer severe frostbite trying to find a parking place. <laughs> I really think that's one thing that all of the 50 or 60 SUNY campuses share. No place to park. So I may be here tomorrow, wandering around looking for my car. <laughs> and the slightest idea. The other is that I found out from Hillary that there was an error when I received my MSW decades and decades ago, and then I never did complete uh, uh, one of the, uh, the research assignments. <laughs> so I'll see some of you in class and you know, we can sit next to each other. But I suppose we're here with this delicious food from the Saigon Bangkok restaurant. I don't know if I'll get paid for that commercial, but uh, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, and it's Da Nang food, by the way. Uh, it's the only restaurant that I've found in upstate New York that has food from uh, Da Nang. It's lovely. It accounts for my spending a lot of time in, in <laughs> Vietnam, as you can tell from my girth. I'd like to share some, uh, some information with you that you may or, or may not be aware of about forgotten people. Um, they weren't forgotten back in the 60s and, and the 70s. Uh, they were the center of the universe of everyone in, in New York State, around the nation, and around the world because we were um, waging an illegal war uh, against a rather small nation in Southeast Asia. 
Some of you may have heard uh, Secretary of State John Kerry yesterday saying that uh, the U.S. government is very upset about what's going on in, in the Ukraine and that Russia has to learn uh, that it cannot invade another country on the basis of lies. He said that. <laughs> I mean, this is a man who went and, and served in the military in, in Vietnam during the war, came back, threw his medals over the fence at the White House, and then became active in veterans against the war. In other words, those who uh, had to purge themselves and maybe this nation from the slaughter that, that we committed in that, uh, in that part of Asia, who's now saying these things. What a difference a day makes. It's amazing. The world has gone crazy. So I'm going to talk with you a bit about what that craziness means in, in Vietnam today, not just yesterday. There is a, uh, a video available to you for free on the, on the, uh, the Internet uh, that I refer you to called Making Peace with Vietnam. Uh, the Making Peace with Vietnam video, it's all there, it's all free, was uh, produced by... Uh, a philosophy professor from Virginia Wesleyan College uh, who came over and spent some time at my programs in, in Da Nang and produced, uh, which was, which I think is the best documentary of Vietnam in the post-Vietnam era and what's happening there today in dealing with the philosophical implications that underpin uh, the development of policy and, and, and uh, the delivery of services. Um, it also covers our programs a lot, so I like the free PR. Um, but Stephen uh, won uh, the New York City uh, Documentary Critics Award, the Beijing China Film Festival Award uh, for long documentaries, so I, I think you'll find it enlightening. And he covers a number of things that it would behoove us to echo a bit today. Uh, in terms of, of Vietnam itself, a 4,000-year-old country, and periodically given different names uh, as a matter of, of routine economic and political suit, uh, divided into three and then divided into two, but it was always Vietnam, uh, a unique nation, uh, about 1,500 miles long and about 82 million people very densely uh, populated, and every little inch and millimeter of land is used for growing herbs or rice or something. There's no waste of, of land. I remember when uh, uh, my program administrator came to visit SUNY uh, for the first time a number of years ago, and I was driving her from the Buffalo Airport out toward Batavia, where I live, not in Batavia, in beautiful downtown East Pembroke, where we have a hardware store. <laughs> Small, but it has hammers. Um, and we were driving along Route 33, uh, going east, and she looked out the window and she said, where are all the motorbikes? Are they banned on this road? Because there are countless motorbikes in, motor bikes in, uh, in, in Da Nang as a common source of transportation. It's very noisy, very congested. Uh, the students who go there for the first time think they'll never make it to the other side of the road. Um, her next question was, why is all this land empty? Nobody's growing anything. They're not growing pecans or pineapples or rice or, or anything. So the land, even though it may look like it, it's empty, is never empty. It's used for... Uh, the survival of the nation. It's primarily an agricultural country. There are some changes going on. Um, so I should explain how I got into this madness. In 1967, I worked for Erie County uh, Department of Social Services as a foster care caseworker. My, my education and training uh, consisted of having taught in an inner city school, seventh grade, for four years. Uh, and then finding out that I could make more than the $3,600 a year salary I was getting as a school teacher, 
I could actually make $5,300 becoming a caseworker for Erie County. <coughs> Think of that. It's amazing. Um, so I went down for an interview, and the fellow in charge of child welfare said, well, you've been teaching for, uh, for a few years. Uh, is, is your uncle a policeman in the city? I said, he is. Oh, we'll hire you. <laughs> so I walked across from the, the county hall to uh, the library in downtown Buffalo and picked up Alfred Kadushin's child welfare text so I could know something about what I was just hired to do. And three weeks later, I had a caseload of 67 children in foster care that I was responsible for, still trying to figure out what a foster home was. And two weeks after that, I received a letter in the mail from the President of the United States. I was officially drafted into the U.S. Army. So I didn't have a long career in, in Erie County, which was probably better for the children at that point, uh, certainly for the foster parents. Um, and then I went off to train. And then I went to Vietnam. Uh, this was a period of time, remember, when the city was dealing with demonstrations and counter-demonstrations. Uh, places burned. People were hurt. Good people fled across the border to Canada, and good people cursed them. Uh, it was a time of contradictions and a time of pain, all centered around this tiny little nation of Vietnam, a nation that reached out repeatedly to the United States for help over over hundreds of years, they sent an envoy to meet with Abraham Lincoln, who refused to meet with him. Uh, during World War II, they fought alongside the French and the Americans and the British, as a matter of fact, in fighting against the Japanese occupation of, of Vietnam. Um, in 1945, at the end of the war, the leader of, uh, of uh, the political movement, the communist political movement in the North, Ho Chi Minh, their version of George Washington, except he didn't have wooden teeth, uh, nor a wife named Martha because he never married, uh, went into Binden Square in Hanoi and proclaimed Vietnam independent, independent of the French, independent of foreign occupation and certainly independent of the Japanese. He was flanked by OSS agents, the previous, and now we call them CIA, uh, who were there to watch Ho Chi Minh read the Declaration of Independence, which parroted the U.S. Declaration of Independence. And he reached out to President Truman to recognize this nation as being independent, free, and sovereign with its own history and its own future. Very exciting time in Vietnam, except France had colonized Vietnam a hundred years before and it never left. And it didn't plan on leaving. And President Truman had to make a choice, a choice of supporting the Vietnamese government just declaring itself independent or supporting the French, with whom we had made great investments during a war that had just ended in Europe. And he sided with the French, and the rest is history. It was, it was, to a large degree, his fault that all of the madness that ensued ensued. Well, there's a lot in the in the media about <coughs> Iraq being the longest war. Well, it, it really was not. We never declared war. We never really declared an invasion of Vietnam. But we had troops there fighting and and, and flying airplanes for the French in the middle 1950s, uh, and the war ended in 1975. After 58,000 Americans died in country in that war, 3.2 million Americans fought in that war, 3 million Vietnamese were slaughtered in that war, and the country itself, of course, was devastated. Well, in 1998, I went back to Vietnam for the first time. And while I was there during the war, my one year with the U.S. Army, I was an advisor in a small village called Hep Duc near, uh, uh, the mount in the mountain area west of the city of Da Nang and, and uh, 
uh, at the time Pontin province, it doesn't exist anymore. They, uh, they melded it into a Guangdong province. My job is to resettle refugees and lepers and feed people and provide medical care and to try to win their hearts and minds uh, to the American and the Saigon regime cause. Uh, well, there are a lot of very funny stories of Herman pretending he was John Wayne and finding out that he had no soldiery skills at all and they had drafted a man that uh, wasn't going to stay in the military. Um, I won't get into all of those because some of them are fairly raunchy, but afterward I'd be happy to, to share some of those. <laughs> Uh, you're from Senator Gillibrand's office. Why don't you? Sh I'll share them with you. And you can see what the senator does to me. Um, I uh, in 1998 when I went back for the first time, I went back to my village and I visited with folks who were teenagers when I was there during the war, and uh, were in their 40s when I went back in 1998, and they remembered me. Um, which was amazing to me because some of the things I did I was quite proud of and, and some of the things I did I was not proud of at all. And you never know how you're going to be received. When I returned home I received a, a letter in the mail from one of the, uh, the men who was a, a kid when I was there in the village in, the, uh, uh, in 1968 and 1969. Uh, and she wrote me a letter and she said, I want to tell you that my, uh, my grandmother always told me how evil the French were and what they did to people in our valley. Uh, in Heptak Valley, uh, there's a book called Death Valley about that, the, the fighting that went on there. It was the heaviest fighting of the war when I was there. Uh, it's now known as the Valley of Tears by the Vietnamese. No one goes out at night because of the spirits that they feel inhabit that, that valley. She said, so I, was, I have always hated the French because of what my grandmother told me they did here. And then my grandfather always told me how evil the Americans were, how bad they were because of what they did here in Vietnam. So I always thought Americans were evil until I met you because I don't think evil people can laugh the way you can. And she signed her name. Love Tran. Just a little kid in terms of being able to interpret history through people and what their experience is. Uh, being able to find truth in the madness of what we do in academia for a living and, and, and what happens around uh, around the world and trying to understand world events. It's really quite simple. She figured it all out. Um, I just met her uh, again uh, last month when I was, I was back. That um, was 15 years ago when I first went back. She now has a job as an accountant with a Japanese import-export company, doing quite well. Um, it's amazing when you think back to uh, what things were and what they, they could have been. When I returned in 1998 from my first return visit to uh, Vietnam, I published an article about it. You know, we're academics. Academics publish articles about every experience. If, if, you, have, if you struggle with constipation, you're going to write an article about it. You're going to write an article about the psychosocial effects of eating cashews or something. Um, I mean, we just do that. So I wrote the article about about going back. Um, and my college president at Brockport picked that up and asked me what I planned on doing to uh, in, in Vietnam. I mentioned to Hillary before. My answer was nothing. Why would I want to do anything in, in Vietnam? Um, I went and I visited and I wrote an article, it looks good in my annual report, and, and life goes on. Uh, what would you want me to do? He said, well, something. I said, no, but that evening, this Sunday, you know, what do you do when the college president calls you at home on Sunday? And you don't even know if he knows your name, so you have to be kind of careful about how you phrase things, because I have a tendency to use bad words sometimes. 
I mean, what the, you know, I mean, you can tell that that, that happens. Um, that evening, I banged out a four-page proposal for a study abroad program in Da Nang, Vietnam, handed it in on Monday morning. The next morning, we had a 45-minute meeting uh, with the administrators at the college, and by the end of that 45 minutes, they had approved, funded, and authorized this new program in Vietnam and allotted $120,000 for it. And I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. <laughs> it's true. So I called literally dozens and dozens of experts who do such things and folks at the State Department and some people that I, I knew and read everything possible on the Internet, whether it was true or not, it didn't matter. It was invaluable to me, including Wikipedia, I think. <laughs> um, that font of lies. At, at any rate... Um, a month after that, I was back in Vietnam meeting with authorities in central Vietnam and being told by people, including at the U.S. Embassy in Hanoi, it would never be permitted by the Vietnamese government. Uh, not in Da Nang. Uh, that they had separated Da Nang from Quang Nam. It used to be one province, Da Nang, Quang Nam. And the people in charge of the city of Da Nang uh, were to be the, uh, the very conservative members of the party, and they would have nothing to do uh, with, with America, nor even the French. And they said they'll let you pitch, but it will never be approved. Well, it was approved. Um, they said now it will never be implemented. Well, 15, 16 years later, here we are. We're still there. But there were a number of things, I think, that, that we did. Uh, to have that happen. Uh, one was that we didn't come with the American arrogance of, of the cultural imperialist. And we do that all over the world. We have answers. You're poor, you live in a refugee camp, well, let me tell you what we'll do for you, rather than asking. I teach an international social work course, and one of the things we do is to look at a variety of case examples. So I say to them, you have, you have, uh, 30,000 people in a rather small refugee camp in uh, uh, Southwest Asia, uh, and you have enough food and medicine uh, for 10,000. What do you do? And I have yet to have students in the initial discussion come up with the obvious solution. You ask the 30,000 people. Ask the people what they need. Because they know. You don't know the logistics, you don't know the depth of need, and you don't know the, uh, the culture, and you don't know the political ramifications, and you don't know much about the riot if you're going to just give those 10,000 people something, and the other 20,000 people will trample them to death <coughs> trying to get the food. Um, at any rate, in the discussions I had with the authorities in, in Da Nang and, and even in Hanoi, it was a question of we would like to begin a study abroad program based on community service. That phrase now is, of course, interpreted as service learning. Everything is service learning now. Um, but they learn and they, and they provide service. And they said, where will you provide service? And I said, wherever you think we should. What are you going to teach in the courses the students will take who come here? I said, what do you think you want them to know about Vietnam? <coughs> As I mentioned earlier at a meeting, they, they all kind of started jabbering to each other and talking back and forth. And I asked my interpreter, what are they talking about? And she said, they don't believe you. <laughs> I said, what is that? They don't believe what? That they'll decide what the curriculum and service will be. <coughs> Americans come and tell them what they need to, uh, to teach and what kind of service they're going to provide. So they don't believe you. I said, well, then I can't do anything about that. They'll just have to find out. <coughs> and they did. It's a long, long story in terms of the ups and downs, in terms of uh, uh, the relationships we had with the government, but now we get along quite well, and they've given all kinds of awards to the Brockford program, and the Brockford program has gone beyond what it originally thought it would be. Uh, which results in people here and in other countries and, and cities even asking me to talk. I, I don't know why they would listen, but the food is good. <laughs> um, the uh, students who go to the Brockport program go for a full fall, summer, or spring semester. 
They also have an option of going just for the month of July or just the month of June. When they're there, they earn 15 undergraduate credits. The School of Social Work will work out something uh, in the near future so that uh, the students in, uh, in the School of Social Work can also receive graduate credit of some sort. You, you will, right? Oh, okay. We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> now you have to. There's been a public announcement. <laughs> Anybody here from the press, put it in. Please. The dean's not here right now, so we can. Yeah, let's go. Um, they take 15 credits taking courses in Vietnamese history, culture, politics, and language. So they know something about the country in which they're living for 14 weeks. The fifth course they take is our community service course, and that's at the heart of our program. That's a clear foundation of the reason why students go to the Vietnam program and what distinguishes us from any other study abroad program in most places. They intensively take their courses each morning for three hours, Monday through Thursday, just like here. In the afternoon for five to six days a week, for four hours at a time, they engage services. And the services are provided to the elderly who live in a nursing home called the Loving House, run by a group of Roman Catholic nuns. They're the greatest little women you've ever met in your entire life. And one of them is my 94-year-old grandmother. No, not actually. <laughs> She's my girlfriend. And when I go, she puts a little chair we have, I have to sit in that chair. She's a, she's a doll, wonderful person. Akoi is her name. Uh, it's a nursing home that would be closed if it were in New York State because the people grow their own food. Uh, they rake their own leaves. They take care of each other, bathe each other, and they share who and what they are and what they have available. There's a, a woman who... Uh, who has no legs because they were shot off by a U.S. soldier during the war. So she's in a wheelchair. Uh, there is another woman who, by accident, uh, lost her sight. So she pushes the woman with no legs. Uh, and the woman with no legs gives directions so that they, in effect, complement each other. And there are a million, million uh, examples of that in a nursing home. The other that makes it unpopular in places like New York is that every single person in that nursing home is happy. And they all feel that it's a, 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 it's a family, and none of them are asked to play shuffleboard or bingo. Um, it's a grand place. All of these women, 34 of them that live in the nursing home, were found homeless, had been abandoned by families because of circumstances of poverty or disease or death. And they go to this place. And our students go too and work with them and provide services for them, whatever those services might be. Secondly, another afternoon a week, the students go to uh, the Da Nang City Welfare Center. The Da Nang City Welfare Center is a, a, s a series of maybe 15 rambling, highly weathered old concrete buildings uh, that provide service for little kids who are abandoned at the gate during the night by parents or other guardians, um, some of whom are severely disabled because of Agent Orange or other reasons, uh, some elderly, a few lepers, uh, and some who are severely dealing with severe mental illness, uh, who merely ramble and before we started going were just taped into chairs because they didn't have enough staff to take care of. Uh, one of the things we found at the city welfare center was that the city only gave them 50 cents per person per meal uh, for the 40 or 50 people who lived there. Uh, so our students now feed <coughs> them and the programs prepare the food for them. It's a question of what are people's real needs. I suppose we could sit in and ask them about the depression they feel about having to live in the facility and how does that make you feel uh, and go into some uh, some clinical track. But they have to have food. So we feed them. Uh, the next uh, afternoon is spent at the Agent Orange Group Home. 
run by the Da Nang Association of Agent Orange Victims. Uh, it's not really a group home, but there's a group of people who go there. It's a respite program uh, developed by a woman named Miss Yen who worked at the Da Nang Red Cross, who talked with me in the early 2000s about the need for some kind of respite service for the families who were dealing with severely disabled children and couldn't leave the home even for a few minutes. And therefore they couldn't work and therefore they were condemned and doomed to poverty. Uh, so I worked with her and, and some others and uh, this Agent Orange group home came to be. Uh, and that was about uh, probably seven or eight years ago. Uh, they just opened last week their third uh, group home in, in the area of Da Nang because they have 15,000 children uh, disabled as a result of Agent Orange. And the next place where the students spend four hours a week is with Agent Orange disabled families in the mountains, in the rural areas, going off at Pong Nam province and all. Places that take three or four hours to drive to, as a matter of fact, or to take boats to. People who ask for our help, uh, who have children who are born without eyes, with three arms, uh, hydrocephalus, and all kinds of other difficulties, uh, severe dis disabilities. Uh, oftentimes we're too late because we take a few days to be able to get ourselves together to go visit these families and the kids die. Um, now there's two places I mentioned to you that deal with Agent Orange kids. What's Agent Orange? It's a uh, chemical spray. It was a defoliant dropped by airplanes, United States airplanes, in massive quantities over Vietnam to destroy the foliage so that the U.S. could attack the enemy, the Vietnamese. It is the same chemical, I understand, that is now used in Roundup, which is uh, used by farmers as a uh, weed defoliant in the United States. The chemical is called dioxin. Dioxin. And it's known as the deadliest chemical unknown to mankind. Um, let me give you an example. We dumped 20 million gallons of dioxin of Agent Orange, this defoliant, on Vietnam during the war. 20 million gallons. Uh, it was called Agent Orange, by the way, because it was kept in 50-gallon drums, metal drums, with an orange stripe around it to identify what was in it, and therefore it was called that. There was also Agent Blue and Agent Purple, Agent White and all, but the, uh, the infamous Agent Orange uh, certainly uh, uh, has drawn the attention of the world. Um, it was developed uh, originally by a, a chemist at, at MIT, uh, who after several years of, of use uh, went to the world media to apologize and uh, people thought he was he was going to kill himself. Um, however, DuPont, uh, Dow Chemical rather, Dow Chemical and Monsanto, uh, who still continue to ravage the earth, as many of you know, uh, were the ones who uh, were the primary producers and distributors along with 28 other chemical corporations. It was used as, as you said, it was used to kill the full age so the enemy troops couldn't hide because Vietnam was all jungles. It isn't anymore, by the way, but it was. Now, most of the area that I entered into for my original village is all triple canopy jungle. You couldn't see the sky. It's all gone, and it's all gone because we sprayed it with a defoliant 40 years ago. But it does more than that. Uh, Agent Orange uh, has the ability to mutate your DNA, so there's genetic damage that results from that. Uh, we're providing services to the third and fourth generation of Agent Orange victim children in Vietnam at this point. Uh, these are kids born, again, with, with uh, uh, severe disabilities. Um, from paralysis and uh, uh, blindness, <clears throat> deafness, and 
cancers and a lot. Um, and there are 15,000 of those victims in still in the city of Da Nang. Um, there are 300,000 American soldiers like myself who were exposed and developed uh, certain physical conditions, medical conditions as a result of that exposure. Yet that would merely be a helicopter or a fixed wing aircraft flying through a valley and then flying back again and spraying this mist that we were all told was to kill mosquitoes. Uh, certainly we didn't spray anything deadly on our own troops. Um, and then we came back with skin conditions, uh, ischemia and, and uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma and, and uh, kids born with spina bifida uh, at alarming rates um, and people with undiagnosable medical conditions. Um, I came back and four months later I had a heart attack. That made no sense. I was in perfect health. Uh, I thought it might have to do with my alcohol consumption in my village, but I'm sure that wasn't the reason. <laughs> that probably helped me live long. <laughs> um, and then another heart attack uh, uh, two years after that, and that wasn't unique at all. The VA had a, uh, uh, had a program to be able to identify the connection between parents' agent orange exposure and spina bifida incidents. So they went to West Seneca here in, in, in your city of Buffalo, to West Seneca, and they invited uh, uh, soldiers, veterans, who had uh, fought in, in Vietnam uh, and had fathered a child uh, since returning. And they asked them to come to this meeting at a, an American Legion Hall in, uh, in West Seneca. Uh, 250 men came to this meeting. And at one point, uh, one of the VA uh, personnel, they were there doing the study, um, asked for a show of hands on how many of the 250 men who came uh, had children born with birth defects and 200 of them. Put up their hands. <clears throat> Those same conditions exist to this very day in Vietnam. Now, those 300 and some thousand other Vietnam veterans like me get a check every month to compensate us for what they did to us. Um, the Vietnamese get $10 a month from their own government because it's a poor government and they don't have any more. But they get nothing from the U.S. government. Now, if I take this coffee cup, I don't want to destroy my chance to win a car. <laughs> but if I take this coffee cup and I fill it with Agent Orange and I go out here on the quad and I pour it on the grass, that's it, just this amount. The Environmental Protection Agency will wall off that area and destroy any structure within a half mile radius. Bye bye, Baldy Hall. They'll take off the top three feet of soil and we'll burn it and we'll fence that area uh, and try to see if there's any leach from this going elsewhere on, the, on campus uh, for about 30 years. That's this much. Think of 20 million gallons of this stuff being dumped in a, in a, a thin, skinny, 1,500 mile long country and the horrors that still face them. Well, that's what our students get exposed to in terms of helping. Uh, the U.S. government just a few months ago, for the first time, entered into an agreement with Vietnamese government to uh, um, provide services that would decontaminate the soil in what they called hot spot areas. It would be like the airport at Da Nang and so forth. It was military during the war, obviously. And they would be moving these 50 gallon drums around with Agent Orange and some of it would spill and they were filling the helicopter sprayers and, and fixed wing aircraft and some of it would sp spill uh, so that it would create this, what they call hot spot, easily measurable, horrible levels of, of dioxin. 
that's an interesting thing, and it's interesting to me because of the Vietnamese smile and the thank you and the gratitude they express. Because one of the last things that George Bush did, you remember him? Mission accomplished man? Wow. Uh, kind of like the Putin of the West now that I hey, listen to the <laughs> Secretary of State. Um, one of the last things he did was to uh, attend an Asian conference in Vietnam, and it was held in Hanoi. And uh, the uh, State Department, in arranging for his trip, uh, rented the entire Indochina Hotel, a huge modern complex. Uh, so for security for President Bush, they paid for the whole thing, cost them a few million dollars. A little, a little bit more than what we spent to decontaminate the Da Nang airport. And we announced it the day after Bush left. In about 10 years, we'll begin to do this. And what they heard was he spent more in his hotel than he spent on decontaminating a hot spot in, in Vietnam. So it's a hard, it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing to deal with. Our students play games with these kids. They deliver food. They identify kids by doing assessments that are in dire need of emergency medical care. They've saved lives. Uh, <coughs> uh, and much of, of the work we do is, uh, is money donated by folks like you to the Da Nang Quang Nam Fund that you can, uh, you can access by going to uh, agentorangechildren.org, agentorangechildren.org. Uh, you're probably the only NGO and nonprofit that spends 100% of its donations in aid because none of us are worth hiring, so we figure we might as well use the money for the poor, um, which means we're sometimes limited in what kind of aid we can provide. The students, in a very brief period of time, and they're studying abroad in Vietnam, become advocates for the Vietnamese people, especially those in need. And sometimes we'll go to a home and find a little child, as we did uh, uh, about eight months ago, who was emaciated, and he wasn't moving, and his eyelids would flutter a little. Uh, but clearly, he was he was dying. And if you've, you've worked with... Uh, uh, in, in developing areas where kids die from malnutrition, as I have in, in several continents, you have some sense of when a child can't eat anymore. <clears throat> you just wait for that spirit to leave. Um, and that's where this little guy was. And I said, there's not much we can do. Well, the students weren't about to accept that from this balding professor. Um, they just weren't. So we ended up taking this little fellow to... Uh, a hospital run by Catholic nuns at the Catholic Cathedral in Da Nang. Remember, this is a country that's supposed to be against religion. I mean, how silly. Um, at any rate, uh, the nuns that ran the, run this place deal with disabled kids, and they said there's not much you can do for him, but we do have a special diet, uh, mega vitamins and things you can give to disabled kids, it's all liquid, and perhaps you can spoon it and you can, you can gain some weight. So we did do that. The students did it every day as we moved the family next door to our program house where the students live. Um, he uh, gained more attention than anyone else in the program during uh, the months that ensued. And I came back to the States and when I returned I had some bad news and the bad news was that uh, we had a shortage of donations. There was only so much money we had left that I had remortgaged my house twice for the program, and the banks had no sense of humor anymore, and certainly no dedication to Vietnam, so I couldn't do that anymore. Um, so we had to cut back on our services, and we had a choice as we went through it on the board of directors. We could either cut out uh, the, uh, the money that we were using for Chuya, this little boy, or we could shut down the work we were doing in the leper colony with 300 people. Uh, it's a hell of a choice to have, to have to make. And I discussed that with our Vietnamese staff. We have six of them there full time. Um, 
and we decided we had to stop aid for Chuyen because at that point it was not just the food, it was a neurologist and all kinds of medical complications. I hadn't seen him in a few months now, remember, so there was a knock on the door and I went to open the door of the office a little while after our meeting and there's Chuyen being held by his mother. And our program administrator, who wasn't happy with my decision to stop aid, came in and said, oh, Chuyen is here. I said, you set me up. And she said, no, no, I didn't know they were coming. Have a seat. No, you sit here. So the mother's holding this little guy, who's about that long, and he's about four years old, and hands him to me. And he says, Daddy. Needless to say, we came up with the money to be able to, to, to <laughs> on both. <laughs> that experience from the student's perspective, of course, is transformative. The majority of students who go to the, the study abroad program return to Dene. Uh, one of them uh, left Dene after the January program. Uh, and it's going back next week. So it didn't take long sometimes. Some of them find employment teaching English. Some of them work with uh, NGOs with enough money that we don't have to be able to support them. Some volunteer and live in the program house with the, uh, uh, the students and provide service. Um, we had a reunion of the Vietnam Study Abroad program a few years ago. Um, and we had about uh, 120 students from around the country who came. Uh, and it was, it was, and they, they arranged with my wife without my knowing to have it at our house. <laughs> that was, that was very kind. <clears throat> but they bought the beer, so it was really okay. <laughs> and there were no prohibitions. They had all graduated by then. What are you going to do? Um, I don't know if you have the same prohibition here at Buffalo that we have at Brockport where you can't have alcoholic beverages and faculty student interaction. The silliest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> but I guess when you have a teetotaler president, that's the way it's got to be. Um, these students had been there in the 90s and in the early 2000s, and some had just returned, and they sat in groups and talked and cried saying that it had been years since anyone would be able to understand what they had experienced. It had changed them as people. The nation itself of, of Vietnam is changing and it's staying the same today. Its culture hasn't appreciably changed. All those cell phones and, and laptops and so forth uh, and, and video games have invaded them like they've invaded us. Uh, but the, the core of their culture remains the same. Their commitment to family and to group welfare, their commitment to generosity, their commitment to, to kindness, their commitment to not forgetting what it was in the past, but not dwelling on it, because it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, that's why there's no anger toward America. There's no hatred of America greatest fear of all our students who go. How are they going to feel about us after the, uh, the atrocities that we committed there? Um, as they say in Vietnamese, life is much too short to waste it on what isn't and what was. Um, yet, on the other hand, sometimes history repeats itself. Last month, there were three cruisers from the U.S. Navy that docked in Da Nang. Da Nang Harbor, where 500,000 Marines in 1964 landed to begin the hottest part of the war. Uh, these, uh, these American warships docked in order to continue discussion about sending U.S. Marines to Vietnam to train them in uh, combating terrorism. Well, that makes terrific sense in a nation that doesn't have any terrorism, but you never know. In fact, in a nation like the city of Da Nang, where its last murder was three years ago and it has 700,000 people, populations bigger than Buffalo, 
When was the last murder of Buffalo? Saturday. Uh, a nonviolent nation. Of course, they ban guns there, so they, they probably, if they don't have the Second Amendment. People can hunt, however. You go to the, uh, the police station in national park areas and you rent a gun for the day, kill your deer, take it home and bring the gun back and get your deposit. Um, but they don't really think that having a shotgun in the house or uh, a revolver on their belt will protect them against some kind of military assault of some sort. Uh, but we have folks running around this country in their camouflage thinking this will save us from totalitarian government. Uh, you know, we have a, a school shooting in America once every other day. Never had a school shooting in Vietnam. Of course, there aren't any guns. Maybe that's, that's part of it. I mean, maybe it's too simplistic on my part. Vietnam, a nation at risk again because of this war on terror. You see, America is now Vietnam's greatest trading partner. Uh, when I started going back in the, uh, uh, in the late 90s and the early thousands, 2000s, we were 17th on the list of, uh, of trading partners. We're now, we're now number one. It may have something to do with large corporations in America in terms of cheap labor and resources in Vietnam. That's an old story. Uh, but it's not an old story that about eight months ago, Monsanto and Dow both opened new chemical plants in Vietnam. Think of that. Just think of it. Uh, I don't have the shortest, I don't have the longest temper in the world. I'm an old non-vet, but I can tell you that there's some things that just drive me up the wall. And even thinking of that atrocity. It would be like the company that made the, the ovens in Auschwitz coming back and building a resort in Poland. Same kind of horror. <coughs> but that's what we do there. There's some idle thoughts on, on, on Vietnam. Um, my hope is that UB will, uh, will become active and involved. Uh, the students who come are not all social work majors, and most of them come from around the country. They're not all certainly Brockport students. We've had uh, a number of students from here, so your study abroad office knows about us, uh, and from uh, uh, California as far away as Albania and Australia. So they, they come from everywhere to, to go to Denang and a little tiny Brockport College program. You can change the world, you know. And when I began, I talked about the forgotten people. Well, now you can't forget a little Chu Yin died because students kept him alive for a number of months. Put that on your resume. It'll give some sense of what you can give back. So if you're interested, there's literature. If you want uh, to talk about other aspects of, uh, of Vietnam, if you have questions, please. What do you think was the purpose, the real purpose, of those three cruisers pulling into Da Nang Harbor, the United States and England? To threaten China. You see there, you look out at the harbor in, in Da Nang. It has what was called during the war China Beach. It's the most beautiful beach in the world. Our students, by the way, are there today. Look out the window. I walked from this parking lot and thought I was going to die from frostbite. And all my students are sitting and bathing and sunbathing and swimming in the, in the South China Sea. But when you look out into the uh, South China Sea, called the East Sea there, you see little islands, little rock formations in the distance. Those are the Spratly and Paracel Islands, and oil's been discovered there. So those islands are now being claimed. They were always seen traditionally as Vietnamese. They're being claimed by China. Uh, but there are parts that are also claimed by Taiwan and, and the Philippines uh, and Malaysia, uh, because they, they scatter all over uh, that particular sea. 
but uh, uh, the uh, the Chinese uh, have threatened to kill the Vietnamese if they occupy the Paracel Islands, and it clearly is just because of oil. Uh, so the Vietnamese uh, last year sent 20 soldiers, 20, well actually policemen, uh, from the city of Da Nang on a boat, a little rickety boat, and went out to the uh, uh, the islands and built a shack on it and put up the Vietnamese flag and said it's now Vietnam's. So there are 20 Vietnamese policemen who live on this island to protect the coast of Vietnam. It was it was almost like a funny sitcom. Uh, but they're threatened by Chinese military vessels, the Navy that goes by. Um, we want to strike a certain balance, we're told by Washington. Well, we wanted to strike a certain balance in the 1950s and 1960s, too, when we invaded that country without cause. They never did anything to us, ever. Uh, there's this old Gulf of Tonkin resolution. It was a lie. The same as Remember the Maine, Spanish-American War. Uh, it was a lie, too. Blew up because a boiler was defective. We blamed the Spanish. So we have a long history of doing that kind of thing. Um, in any event, uh, they will indeed bring military onto a base in South Vietnam, and I, or in Vietnam. I presume it will be in Da Nang because it's our largest military installation in, in the nation of Vietnam. And they'll provide some training, but they'll provide a presence. The U.S. Navy will. Yes, they'll provide a presence. And that presence is supposed to... Uh, um, to send a clear message to China to keep your hands off that oil. Uh, remember, um, when General Westmoreland, the commander of most of the uh, U.S. forces during much of the Vietnam War, was asked, what was it about? Was it really there to contain communism? And he said, no, it had nothing to do with communism. We were there to control the trade routes through South Asia. That was it. You see, no wars begin over ideology. They all begin because of economics. Every one of them. Uh, you, you think of World War II. When we threatened to embargo Japan with a Navy blockade. Well, Ukraine and the oil pipelines. Sure, same thing. And it's going to happen. It's going to obviously. Because they supply, what, a third of the, oil, uh, of, uh, of the fuel for Europe. Um, so the same things will occur. And Japan said at the time, if you're, you're going to embargo us with your navy and try to starve us and take our troops out of China, then we'll destroy the navy so you can't do it. And then we call that Pearl Harbor. But it, it wasn't like without provocation. Uh, well, okay, look. Let, let's be realistic here. The Japanese invaded China, invaded all the Philippines, did a lot of killing, yeah. invaded Korea. So don't make them out to be the good guys in this. They weren't. Okay, I, I agree. We, we maybe pulled some strings here and there. But be realistic. Why do they bomb Pearl Harbor? Again, because of what we said. I agree. But the reality is they didn't, They invaded a lot of countries and caused a lot of grief. The rape so, of Nanking and, and the horrors that they perpetrated in Hanoi and the cities up uh, even as far away as Laos were, dis were, were despicable. I'm not making them up to be good well, guys. Well, yeah, it just sounded like you're making an excuse for them. And again, I'm, no. I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm saying, okay, you know, you're right about yeah. some of the lies. You're right about the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. You're right about the member of the name. But, but this part here, they did a lot of bad things. Sure did. And deserved to be taken out because of what they did. It was a bad, bad thing they did. I mean, again, they killed a lot of innocent people. I mean, we did too. After like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yes, I agree. We did too. That's what I just said. We did too. Sure. Well, there, are, there really are no, there are no innocent people no. from a war. And war by definition. They're, they're the ones that get killed the most. The innocent. And I think there's so many different directions that these conversations could go. 
But given that we don't have the three weeks to process all of this, I wonder if we could refocus a little bit more on the humanitarian work that, that is being done, because I think there might be some more questions, especially about what social workers might be able to do. Um, so I, I apologize for cutting you off, but I would like to refocus us a little bit. Can I, can I mention Da Nang University for a second? Da Nang University, uh, uh, obviously the university in the city of Da Nang, uh, is beginning a new social work education program. Uh, the faculty in the, the uh, Department of Social Work at Brockport are beginning this week uh, to co-teach courses with the Vietnamese faculty in Da Nang via Skype. Uh, the great challenge, of course, is that Vietnam is 12 hours ahead of us. So I have a class tomorrow morning at 6, <laughs> so, and I'm getting really old, so I don't know how long that's going to continue, uh, but I hope a while. Could be worse, could be long. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> brother, you're right. <laughs> the other is that uh, uh, students uh, are being urged uh, to mentor students in, uh, in the new social work education program at, uh, in, uh, at Da Nang University. So they're, they're, it's a loose term of, of mentoring because they're not really there like quasi-teachers or instructors. They're there to discuss, share, build relationships so that our students get a clearer idea of how to deal with things that social workers traditionally have to deal with in a nation like Vietnam with a very different culture. Uh, and they, on the other hand, have some things they can compare with what they do and, and make decisions on how they're going to practice in the future. Uh, so we have students that do that too, and they do it on their own, uh, as do the uh, the faculty that are involved in this collaboration. One of the things we talked about was a possibility uh, the School of Social Work might get involved in such things. But if, if you're interested in doing that, I presume one of these 90,000 sheets of paper they're giving you in the red folders probably has an email address on it somewhere for me. You feel free to send me an email, and I will uh, put you in touch with the uh, social work student who's coordinating that work. I could also prepare the students in the room for when they go to uh, the study abroad program. But social work, you know, in that country is very different. It is a history of, of being charity. It has a history of doing what the Buddhist culture expects to do in terms of sharing. Uh, it has a history of quasi-professional social workers from the time the French colonized that country. And most of those were Catholic. They were religiously based uh, charities, kind of like our Catholic charity sort of thing. Um, they do not emphasize in their social work education the value of the individual. This gets them into trouble with Western countries who see things differently, and sometimes our own profession of of social work. Um, rather, they emphasize the value of the group and the value of the family. Um, I mentioned to you when we had a meeting earlier about a meeting I had in Vietnam with our administrator, a Vietnamese woman, uh, who really runs this program in, uh, in Da Nang. We had an evaluation meeting for the six people that are in the staff with the city government that partners with us in running this program. Uh, and I gave everyone on the staff high marks in terms of the quality and dedication and all. And I said that much, much of that is because of our administrator. And she was furious with me. We get in a cab, leaving the meeting, slammed the door. And I felt like that stereotypical male where his wife is angry with him and he doesn't know why. You know, but, but what is this? She said, you praised me. And I thought, what a mean bastard I must be. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but you deserved it. She said, no, no, no. You don't understand that in Vietnam, when you praise somebody who's a member of a group, you're saying something negative about the rest of the members of the group. Wow. So I apologize for praising her. Never did it again. Mm -hmm. um, but you understand the, how the, what the implications of that might be in delivering services to people. Um, I mean, think of that. Um, 
Can I ask a question on that? Is that part of the training process for the students then to understand that? <clears throat> okay. Yeah, it, they they uh, their culture course is an example. Uh, concentrates a lot on food because you can you get a sense of, of, of the you have some of that today. The balance of hot and cold and the colors, and the designs and, and flavors and all, creating that yin yang kind of balance. And then the relationships are very much the same way. Um, and that sense of what we've been used to do, to doing, um, that not only is ineffective, it's damaging if we do those same, even well-meaning sort of things in a culture, because we can work toward destroying a culture. Um, and I can, I can clearly, you'll know, I can honestly say that I've learned much more during the 15 years uh, of, of work in that country than, uh, than I've been able to teach. Uh, and in Vietnam, too many people go to teach. You should go to learn. Do you know of um, the? And is it 120 total that have studied over the years in this? Ex ex no, 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 200. 200. Okay. Have any of them been able to go on and work in other countries to pursue international yes. social work? Yeah, we've had. I, I know of seven or eight who have gone to the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. Um, I know of uh, a number that have gone to Japan, um, and uh, uh, some that have three that have gone to Cambodia. Uh, and two that have gone to uh, to Romania. These are just off the top of my head, so the, yeah, they do that. Um, a number of them do come back and get jobs teaching children English. If you have no skills and you can speak your native tongue, what the hell? Maybe somebody will pay you for, for talking. Um, and they stay at the program house uh, when they do those that kind of employment. Which house? I'm sorry. Um, Brockport has a, a house in central Da Nang called the program house. That's where the students live and eat and take their courses and entertain all their friends from the community. Um, and where we have offices for both the NGO and, and the Brockport program. Uh, the five-story house has a lake across the way, beautiful little thing, and a tiny little culvert in, right in the center of, uh, of the inner city. Uh, and that's where all the work happens. So when you want to go, that's where you'll go. If you access a study abroad site at SUNY Brockport, by the way, uh, and then click on the Vietnam program. They have pictures of all these places that I'm describing to you. Yes? How many faculty from your program at Brockport participate? In the collaborative <coughs> Two others. But how many actually go? They, they're teaching here. Mm -hmm. And then what about how many go to Vietnam? Well, we've had... Uh, Three of them visit the program in Vietnam. We have another going in about two weeks. Um, the one is going in a couple of weeks is going because we have two students doing their black field placement, and he's the liaison. So it would be like doing your, your field placement at Erie County DSS and having a faculty person come and visit you. Just this is a little farther away. <laughs> Lucky faculty person. <laughs> Well, I have a question about um, continuation, uh, particularly of the nonprofit. You've mentioned that you're um, no spring chicken. And so how about that? <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> um, I said I'm an old bastard. I didn't say that. <laughs> green chicken. So as far as the um, NGO then, I mean, are you – Developing new board members. I mean, what's sort of the we're always developing succession. new board members. My my wife was an LCSW and has spent a lot of time in uh, in Vietnam. Uh, if we're planning my death here, <laughs> we'll fill it. I have uh, uh, eleven children, 
Yeah, I know. No, I'm sorry, I'm not that fertile. Five of them are adopted, but three of them are birth children, the rest are stepkids. Needless to say, you've heard me for an hour or so, you know there's been probably a lot of marriages. At any rate, mm -hmm. um, the two youngest are three and seven. They just came back from Vietnam. They, they, they go every few months with us. Um, so they can pick it up. That's long distance view. <laughs> or you could decide that all of this sounds intriguing and interesting, and you could get involved. Just a quick email. No one ever says no. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a nice note to end on. So thank you so much. Thank you.